See that nice retaining wall behind the locomotive underneath the grass slope? Are you in for some fun with retaining walls today? Hi, this is your host, Burr Stewart. Today we're going to watch a live demonstration of how I blended that retaining wall into the scenery and also take a tour of a whole bunch of retaining walls that I've photographed in various train layouts that I visited. Let's start with some examples. My friend Dave Enger is a civil engineer, so he tends to like retaining walls, and some of these shots come from his layout in Kirkland, Washington. As shown here, retaining walls can be used to prop up ground throws for switch machines, to scenic the approach to a helix, to protect the spillway for a dam, to keep the hillside off of a ground throw, to protect the track from the ocean side, and to separate one track from another. And in all these cases, I really give close attention to how the scenery touches the retaining wall at the top. And the whole rest of this video is about how to do that. Here you can see Dave's work on the left to build and color that retaining wall, which you may recognize from my earlier live streams. And on the right is a new retaining wall that he just installed last week using push pins to hold down the liquid nails putty. You may recognize that from earlier live streams as well. Today what we're going to do is remove the push pins and I'm going to shape and paint the scenery around the retaining wall so that it can look like it's always been there. So the first thing we have to do is get rid of all of the movable objects in the vicinity and take out the push pins. I normally do this job with two hands, but I need to stay out of the way of the camera. Sorry about that. Let's speed up the video. That's better. Now we need to get rid of the rest of all these removable objects. I need some of these things to be removable because behind this retaining wall is a track going to the Terry Avenue branch of the Great Northern and then the Burlington Northern that I model. I want to be able to get back there for track cleaning and re-railing cars and that sort of thing. Okay, now we bring out the lightweight spackle and the little spatula and we get to work. It's important not to rush this and to use a small enough spatula that uh, you can work with the little cracks in the brick detail in these chooch retaining walls. But I'm not going to bore you with the entire job minute by minute. I just accelerated the video so we can get through in a reasonable amount of time. One of the reasons I like this lightweight spackle is that it dries quickly enough that you can paint it after an hour or so. And we're going to do that here. Uh, I'll show you some pictures of retaining walls while we let this dry. And then we'll be able to go back the same day and paint it and put on the ground cover. You could argue that I don't need to be putting spackle down next to the ground there because it'll be covered by ballast once I put the track in there and ballast the track. And you would be correct. I just got carried away making this video. Now we're doing the more precise part of the job, which is to get any stray spackle out of the cracks in between the rocks in the retaining wall. 
Here you can see this at regular speed. It's really good to go over the top edge of the retaining wall and make sure to get any spackle out of the little cracks between the bricks just to give you more flexibility in the next phase of you know putting shrubs and bushes in. We won't get that far today but sometime. So there it is. We've got our spackle all the way around the retaining wall and all we have to do is give it an hour to dry and we can come back and apply our latex paint and ground cover to it. So while we wait, let's just look at a couple of other examples of retaining walls on my layout that we've built. Here's a very similar chooch retaining wall and you can see we just brought the ground cover right up to the wall. I suppose in real life there would be some sort of a bush or guardrails or fence or something to keep people from falling off that. But that's beyond the scope of today's video. Next I want to show you another chooch wall that we put in where I forgot to do the spackle job. And this is what happens when you rush too much and you end up with a kind of a raw edge there. It, it, it doesn't look too bad, but it doesn't look too good either. If I had just put spackle like we're doing today, that would look more finished. Well, now that our spackle has had time to dry, let's uh, do some final finishing of the surface and uh, get the paint on. I'm using a small piece of sandpaper to smooth the, any rough or weird edges in that spackle surface. This is a little risky because the lightweight spackle has only been drying for about an hour. And it's possible to uncover the crust on the surface and gouge it out and ruin the finish of what you want. But I'm just trying to be careful. Maybe a soft sanding sponge would be a better tool. I'll speed this up now, but you, you get the idea. Now we'll take the shavings off and we'll be ready to paint. It's always good to test your work with your finger because you can feel any irregular surface quite easily. This is looking real good to me. Now we're ready to paint and the most important thing to know is to keep quart sized jars in gallon sized plastic bags in order to prevent them from going bad too soon. This is an earth color paint that I use for all my ground cover. And I'm going to start by shaking it up. Don't ask me how I know that it's a good idea to put a piece of paper or a drop cloth underneath a paint can when you're using it. Okay, are you excited? We use a screwdriver to open up the paint lid and then we take a very small brush and paint all of that white area with our 
basic dirt color and then we'll sprinkle the Woodland Scenics uh, blended turf on there that I've generally saved from previous projects. I take a lot of care with the edges, of course. Another way to do that might be to put down masking tape on the retaining wall. Then I could just paint right up to the masking tape. I guess it's a trade-off between how long it takes to put down the masking tape and how long it takes to slowly take care with the edges. I'm a little concerned that the paint is starting to dry, so I'm going to put the ground foam down on the first section first and then come back and finish the part on the right. Like I said before, this is pretty foolish to be putting grass down on an area that I know a piece of track is just going to sit on. I thought it would be good to test this because I had a vague memory that David suggested that I cut down that corner. So I put the concrete wall up against it and realized he was right. Took out my trusty red Sureform tool and on the fly there made a slight adjustment to the scenery profile. Well, that was painless. Now we can finish the painting. Put away the paint and put our last bit of ground foam on the wet paint. While we let this dry, let's take a look at a bunch of other examples of retaining walls in model railroads. We'll start with cement and masonry ones, and then we'll move to timber. Pay close attention to the edge between the top of the retaining wall and the scenery, whether it be track in this case or regular terrain. Interesting iron plates that were used to reinforce this one. Now on to some timber retaining walls. This was on Jim Vale's famous HON3 layout. I love the humor in the way he had one of those ore carts fall off the edge. Pay no attention to that green monster staring at you past the trestle. And don't forget your nut bolt washer castings. This was a popular way to do a retaining wall with old uh, railroad rail holding up old ties. And here's an example of the Canadian Pacific mainline retaining wall, a big model. And one of my favorites, look how Russ Segner pulled the dirt down and this old timber retaining wall and his S scale layout. Beautiful. Here are a couple examples from my layout. I didn't use spackle on the top of this. I just butted the ties right up against the bare foam. On this big curved wall, 
by the time I got done gluing all these railroad ties on there, I was concerned about the clearances with the track, so I left off the vertical rail posts. Nobody seems to have complained so far. And last but not least, look what Cliff Green did on his end scale layout in Portland, Oregon with sheet pile retaining walls. Well, back to the project at hand. It's uh, been 24 hours now, so the paint has dried and we can vacuum up the excess grass. I put an old stocking over the nozzle of the vacuum cleaner and that way we can recover anything that we suck up. I use kind of a knocking motion with the nozzle to dislodge any grass that's loose since it's been over 24 hours and the paint is definitely going to retain plenty of that grass. I'll show you in a minute why it's so important to me to keep vacuuming behind this scenic element because there's a track back there. Now for the fun part, recovering the grass. I challenge you to hold on to a nozzle and unscrew a cap at the same time. If I can do it, you can do it. This is one of the strangest jobs in model railroading, trying to get the grass out of that stocking without making a mess and without taking forever. You know, it's hard to know how much recovery is worth the effort. This seems a little silly, so I'm going to speed it up. There, mission accomplished. We still have a stash of grass to use for our next scenery project. Well, all that's left now is to admire our work and put all the removable pieces back where they were. From various angles, looks pretty good. First we'll put the tank back in place and then do the Emerson Street Bridge. We're still doing research on the color of this tank. It's kind of a salmon pink which is the color that it is today. But since we're modeling 1973, I have a suspicion it was a, a grimy black color back then. If you have any information on this, give us a note in the comments. That token figure there on the stairwell is clearly frustrated that he doesn't know the answer either. I should get some kind of award for how many times I've taken this bridge out and put it back in again when I knew there was still work to be done. For example, here we need to attach that little piece of track with rail joiners. And to do that, I'll have to take this bridge out again. But I keep wanting to finish a project and put it back and admire it. So I guess that's all part of the design process. We'll let it go this time.
Now we can see how we like the look of the retaining wall with the oil cars in front of it. We have plans to put some bushes and trees in this area, just not for today's video. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. Let me just take a moment to show you the track behind all this. This was called the old NP mainline and it, it used to go across the Lake Washington Ship Canal up to the University of Washington and beyond. In later years, it was called the Terry Avenue branch because it went up to the Lake Union Industries. We have a switch job that goes up there, and uh, like I'm always saying, we'll show that to you in a future video. For now, let's just admire our retaining wall. Uh-oh, I hear a train coming. Really? It shorted out because I didn't flip the switch right? Please. Now I'll get ahead on the next one. That retaining wall looks like it's always been there, doesn't it? Well, it looks like it's not a whole train, but just a couple of engines. But it'll have to do for today. Next time, maybe we can have more train action. These are the new Athern GP18s, and they really are beautiful. I love the uh, rotating beacon. You know, as we look at that retaining wall one last time, I would comment that it's a background model, and I normally use several colors of ground foam to put down. As you can see on the right there, start with dirt and then put on grass, and I like to to do that when I care about the scene, but in this case I was just scenicing around a retaining wall. Your eye is going to go to the retaining wall and we're going to cover that hillside with shrubs and trees anyway. But just in case you thought I was being too simplistic, I wanted to let you know it was deliberate. So for now, thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. This is your host, Burr Stewart, wishing you much fun with trains.